So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, event, which is uh, uh, part of a series of uh, webinar uh, organized by the uh, Excel uh, Eric uh, Consortium uh, within the uh, Accelerate uh, project. Um, my name is Manuele Gatti. I'm associate professor at Politecnico di uh, Milano. And I'm glad to share this uh, uh, webinar, which uh, will focus on uh, the material compatibility issues uh, for the CCUS chain uh, with uh, special focus on uh, uh, CO2 uh, transport. Uh, before I introduce the two speakers uh, uh, that uh, I thank for uh, their uh, participation today were Bjorn Molland and uh, Luca Ansaloni. Let me give you uh, a few instructions when uh, uh, you join and then uh, an overview of uh, Excel and of the Accelerate uh, project. Uh, first recommendation, uh, uh, you should uh, uh, turn your microphone off uh, for the whole duration of the webinar as well as uh, your camera should we should be deactivated uh, we will host the q a session at the end of the second presentation so please uh, for any question write them uh, in the chat uh, whenever you want uh, then a uh, few words about uh, excel excel uh, stands for uh, european Carbon Dioxide Capture and Storage Laboratory Infrastructure is a consortium of several European nodes, so several European research infrastructure working in the field of CCUS are, have been joining forces uh, over uh, the last years to uh, uh, support the development of CCUS. There are uh, multiple facilities uh, distributing along uh, uh, many countries. Norway is where the operation center uh, is located, France, Italy, UK, and the Netherlands. And uh, um, the uh, uh, network has been uh, expanding and growing uh, over the years, thanks to collaborative uh, European funded, but also industrial uh, projects. You see the budget at the bottom, and the major goal are to increase the technological maturity of the CCUS chain. About the Accelerate project, which is promoted by institution from the Excel network, this is going to an end by the end of this year, is a four-year project with a budget of 3.5 million euro, focusing on extending the operation of the Excel facilities, and uh, advancing the market uh, uh, maturity of uh, the technology. So providing services, not only to the academia, but also to the industry, and to put uh, together in a collaborative way, the comp competencies that uh, are distributed among the different uh, nodes. The other goal was to uh, extend uh, the application from CCS to CCUS, including uh, uh, utilization. Um, Within the uh, Accelerate project, there is this capacity building program that uh, is the reason why a webinar are hosted. And so in the capacity building program, uh, focusing on uh, extending the capabilities of the community working in the field of CCUS, so a researcher, but also uh, professional uh, uh, engineers uh, and the people gravitating in the field of CCUS, uh, the idea is to provide a webinar a uh, specific workshop uh, or summer school, like the one uh, hosted by OGS, the Italian uh, referent of the uh, uh, Excel node in Panarea, or the one hosted by Sota Carbo in Sulcis, and even tailored training course have been uh, hosted since the beginning of uh, Accelerate. Uh, coming to uh, today's uh, agenda, uh, the speakers are uh, Bio Dr. Bjorn Helg Morland from uh, IFI, the Institute for Energy Technology in Norway, and uh, Dr. Luca Ancelloni from uh, Sintef. Uh, let me go deeply uh, in their uh, profile. So Dr. Uh, Morland 
has uh, more than 20 year experience in the field of uh, CO2 transport with a special focus on uh, testing and experimentation. He got a PhD in uh, corrosion uh, of uh, the space CO2 uh, from the University of uh, Oslo. He has been chairman of several specialized conferences, uh, international conferences in the field of CCUS, and is actively working as an author of uh, research uh, paper, publishing more than 40 papers. Uh, his uh, speech uh, will focus on uh, uh, the uh, corrosion issues related to carbon steel uh, transport system in order to devise uh, uh, optimal CO2 specification. Uh, then there will be the speaker, the, the, the speech from uh, Dr. Luca Saloni, who is a chemical engineer by education. Uh, he got a PhD from the University of Bologna, and uh, he has been working uh, um, for more than 10 years in the field of membranes for uh, uh, CO2 capture. And his speech uh, today will focus on uh, uh, the interaction between uh, uh, polymeric materials and uh, uh, dense phase uh, uh, CO2. Uh, he has published more than 40 papers and uh, uh, he owns uh, uh, four uh, uh, patents. So now I leave the floor to Dr. Uh, Morland, uh, who is going to deliver the speech on carbon steel transport systems uh, and uh, cross chemical reactions within uh, CO2 uh, specification. Uh, I repeat that uh, any question shall be uh, delivered in the uh, chat, and there will be the question and answer session at the end uh, of the second presentation. Every presentation will last uh, between 20 and 25 minutes. So, Dr. Morland, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for the kind introduction. Um, Yes, and hi, uh, hello everybody. Before I start, I just have to apologize. I have a sort of a sci sinusitis uh, condition and a low fever, so bear with me if I have to cough uh, a little bit during the presentation. I will talk about um, carbon steel transport system and the cross chemical reaction which can uh, uh, occur during CO2 transport uh, today. Uh, and uh, we are talking about CCS, which works like this. The CO2 is uh, is captured and uh, compressed and then transported in a uh, pipeline or ship. We do not discriminate uh, to a reservoir for storage or uh, EOR purpose or whatever. Uh, our or my focus is the transport system. And uh, it is, uh, I am a corrosion scientist, so it's a... Uh, we have sort of a fairly simple task. We we uh, we have two questions we have to answer: is uh, the material selection, which material can we use for this, and the secondly is what is the contra uh, the corrosion contribution for the thickness of the of the pipe or the ship. So uh, so it's two simple questions. Of course, it's a lot of work to get uh, to that point, but the thing is that. Uh, <clears throat> For CCS, uh, the capex was the govern uh, choice of material. Uh, we had to keep the cost low, so it was quite early uh, said that uh, carbon steel has to be used. We have to use the cheapest material we can use, or else we can't run CCS. So then we are only left with one question, actually, and that is, uh, what is the corrosion uh, contribution? How many millimeter do we have to add to the pipe or the ship to maintain the pressure and safe or the integrity of the transport system. So uh, that was what we did in the beginning. We jumped into the task. Uh, we had the uh, uh, experience from the oil and gas uh, industry. So we have closed autoclave system and uh, we injected impurity. Here we have uh, two different uh, uh, two different experiments we run in in this closed autoclave system. We put these in uh, in a rotating cage so we could sort of uh, mobilize the the CO2 and the corrosive phases. And the corrosive phases is really low in a in a closed autoclave system. So you are more or less lucky if something hit your coupon in the end. But uh, we quite early we saw that uh, for carbon steel, uh, 
especially nitrogen dioxide uh, was very corrosive. You had up to 1.6 millimeter per year on the uh, on a fairly high level of, of nitrogen dioxide and uh, also some water. Uh, the interesting thing was uh, sulfur dioxide. Here we can see uh, we have a very low corrosion rate and uh, typically in oil and gas, if you are below 0.1 millimeter per year, that's something you can handle for for 30 years project, it's only three millimeter uh, of additional uh, pipe uh, thickness. So, but here we were really low. Uh, the thing uh, I want to point out here is that we see some spot-wise corrosion on the, on the coupons. And the coupon was typically either mounted in the bottom of the autoclave or on some torpedo uh, shaped um, uh, sample holder. The spots uh, was a bit of a concern because it's very easy when you have a really good post analysis system, you go to the spots because those are interesting. And as you see here in the SEM, we, we looked into a spot and underneath there you could have high localized attack. So even though the general corrosion rate is low, this spot can uh, give a much higher corrosion rate that uh, are wanted. And uh, and the thing we had to think about then was is is these local attack naturally formed there or are there a part of an uh, artifact? Uh, because we have to load the impurity into the system, and for SO2 and NO2 it's quite easy. You could uh, load it as gas, pressurize uh, to a certain uh, millibar and then load the 100 bar of CO2 on top. For water, it's another situation. You have to add it as a liquid. And uh, even at uh, the beginning, it was common knowledge that uh, if you have liquid water and 100 bar CO2, you will have a high corrosion rate. So could these be uh, spots created by the fact that we had to put liquid water into the autoclave system and those uh, droplets of water hit the surface. So to, to just summarize a closed autoclave system that uh, there are a lot of limitation on it. You have a diminutive uh, corrosive phase for a dropout test. If you want to draw a test like, uh, oh, we have acid dropout of the, of the CO2, you have quite a small phase. And also you have an uncertain uh, corrosive phase uh, for the salt test. If the impurity are dissolved, either as acid or uh, individual species, they, um, they might not uh, uh, hit the coupon correctly or it might be consumed if corrosion take place. So, and also another artifact is that uh, in the beginning you add pure uh, sulfur dioxide and then you add pure nitrogen dioxide and liquid water. So you will have in the beginning an increased level of uh, impurities, which uh, is not uh, what you really want because higher uh, impurity levels will give you higher corrosion rate. Uh, and also back to the, the risk of localized attack, which I talked about because it could be induced by uh, injecting liquid water. So we found that, okay, we have to do something about it to, to, to really uh, mimic the situation in a more realistic way. And uh, what we came up with was that uh, we need to have a continuous analyzing, no, continuously injection, sorry, because we have to replenish the impurity. If the impurity are, uh, are corroded the, the away, as you saw with the nitrogen dioxide, which really was a high corrosion, you will not actually test the limit with your, which you are set out to do. And, uh, and when you continuously inject something, you have to take something out or else you will not get it into the system. And in that way, why don't you just send it to an analyzing system? And that was what we did. We made an uh, injection rig of seven individual injection lines so you can make sure that in, uh, the impurity do not meet until they are inside the autoclave. And then uh, we have one stream out, which we can run to an analyzing system where we could uh, detect uh, at least 12 different uh, impurities. 
So, so this was uh, sort of a, a, a the start for us, uh, where we could actually now, uh, in a realistic manner, mimic the CO2 transport. The first experiment we did was uh, actually quite easy. We didn't need all the seven lines. We only needed three. And uh, we have the concentration here on the, on the left. And uh, we started injecting water. And we started the green line, uh, hydrogen sulfide. So hydrogen sulfide and water in the beginning. And then at a certain uh, point there with the dotted lines, we started the nitrogen dioxide injection. And we saw immediately that hydrogen sulfide decreased and also water increased. Uh, and the, the brown line, which is uh, nitrogen dioxide, it didn't appear at all. So, uh, we had the first step of our uh, reaction equation here, which is hydrogen sulfide has to react with nitrogen dioxide. And what does it form? Well, we see sulfur dioxide here, the blue line, and the red line, nitrogen monoxide. And we have the purple line, which is water. So the, the reaction equation gave uh, itself out there uh, immediately when we had control of the impurity which was uh, quite uh, groundbreaking at the time we, when we did that. And, and it's a very beautiful, simple uh, experiment, uh, which shows that uh, cross chemical reaction or interaction with impurity will happen. So what can you do then? If you test only individual impurity, you will not actually see uh, the effect of, uh, of the interaction between the impurity. And, uh, and that is uh, was a good a good start. What we did uh, later on in the experiment, we stopped the nitrogen dioxide, and we saw that the hydrogen sulfide went back to the original uh, line, and also the water came down. So this was sort of a, a non-destructive uh, reaction. You you only get more sulfur dioxide than you get uh, nitrogen monoxide, uh, and nothing more happened. But we couldn't be sure. So what about acid, solid corrosion? Well, you can't see it there. You can only uh, verify that uh, your mass balance or, uh, or species balance, atomic balance, if you like, uh, add up. And then you could say that, OK, nothing else uh, happened. But uh, we ran another test. Uh, at the time, we ran the most popular uh, specification and recommendation. and uh, it was first after opening the experiment, we saw uh, a lump of sulfur and a pool of acid. And this is a Hustloy autoclave. It's a nickel-based uh, material. And uh, the acid was uh, green, which uh, indicates that, um, that uh, you are dissolving nickel in, into the acid as well. So uh, and this was only 8.5 kilogram of this uh, recommendation run through the system and we got these so you could actually see it but what if you are going to transport a gigaton of that then you will have a mountain of sulfur and a sea of acid which of course is not uh, wanted in a transport uh, pipeline and certainly not wanted in a carbon steel pipeline uh, we saw uh, some corrosion we uh, often have double material either a carbon steel or always a carbon steel and then either a, a stainless duplex or a, a nickel alloy or something. And we saw that, well, it's not so high corrosion rate and it's a lot of acid on it. You can see the droplet on the, on the surface there. So maybe it doesn't corrode that much at all. But the thing is that when you produce the acid by reaction, it's highly concentrated. So and a highly concentrated acid is not that corrosive for carbon steel. Uh, but uh, uh, sulfuric acid, uh, the, the sulfuric acid is quite hygroscopic and will over time draw the water out of the CO2, which is transported uh, above it. And then you will dilute the acid and uh, end up in a corrosive envelope. So uh, eventually the corrosion, uh, corrosion rate might actually go up. So, but 
we saw that okay we had to open the system uh, if we're gonna find some co2 limits uh, for impurity we we need something more and that's uh, when we started with transparent autoclave and uh, this system we can run up to 200 bar of co2 and we could uh, have a camera there take pictures and put them together to a, a time lapse video afterward and uh, and that is very important for us because uh, we have the uh, uh, the injection uh, rates we have the measurements so we could uh, in a stoichiometric way uh, see what is happening and if we also could observe if uh, if acid is uh, falling out or corrosion is happening on the coupon then we know the tricky points and in that way we could screen a lot more cases over a shorter time so uh but of course when you can see it's very funny uh, to make uh, videos of other stuff so so we of course did some property studies uh, we have some uh, carbon steel coupons and we are only the only thing happening in in the, these videos are that we are filling the co2 but we have one uh, here lower right one is 25 degrees celsius which is uh, liquid state and then we have uh, 40 degrees celsius of up to the left and just let us have a look at it and uh, it looks in the beginning quite uh, similar but what you can see here on the the liquid 25 degree you have a, a clear two-phase system on the 40 degree we are in a supercritical state and here you can't see any uh, two-phase uh, system coming up there the, the co2 go directly to a supercritical uh, state so it's uh, the value of this uh, i think it's uh, more important just to see it and to understand that it's uh, we are talking about two different uh, system if you have liquid and, and supercritical if it's that important for the uh, reaction and corrosion I, I guess the the temperature is uh, is the important factor here um, and we of course did other uh, uh, type of property study here we have uh, three different concentration of uh, methanol so we have uh, here on the left upper left it's 100 percent methanol then we have 90 percent methanol and then we have 75 percent methanol and let's see what happens when we inject it uh, the thing is if you use uh, thermodynamic models and so on you could actually make solubility uh, chart of yourself and you will find that uh, that methanol is uh, fully miscible in co2 and that, that is what we see here it's it dissolves completely in the co2 same is with 90 percent uh, methanol is also uh, more or less fully miscible while 75 percent then you are stuck with a pool of, of uh, the mix of methanol and water. So it's also uh, nice to know, and uh, especially if you are commissioning a, a pipeline, the question is, should we use uh, water or uh, use TEG or uh, methanol afterwards to push the water out? So it, uh, actually, in this case, it looks that, uh, that methanol is the, the best to use. Uh, but we saw that uh, the, the first test we did on the on the specification at uh, at that time uh, gave uh, an very unwanted uh, results. So we wanted to establish limits, and uh, then we went back a step and just uh, remember the first experiment I show you with the with the closed autoclave, yellow coupon with nitrogen dioxide and water, and here we had the possibility to do it to, to do it with a video. So we sort of a, have a stable uh, around 70, 80 ppm of, uh, of nitrogen dioxide and the black line, then we increase the water. And we can see something happening on the carbon steel. When we increase the water again, we see clearly corrosion on the surface. This is a carbon steel coupon as well, but it has mill scale still on it. And then we have a super duplex on the side there, which is uh, not affected at all. But uh, this is what we saw in the, the closed autoclave system as well, that uh, the, the corrosion just uh, goes on. It, uh, it will probably have stopped quite earlier if we didn't have the continuous injection and uh, analysis of it. But uh, since we are able to do it, it actually corroded quite a lot. 
So then we know that, okay, we have a certain amount of nitrogen dioxide. We have to keep under a certain level of water or else uh, your coupon will corrode or a uh, pipeline or ship. Sorry, I'm, I'm from the lab, so I often say coupon instead of pipeline and ship. But the carbon steel will corrode. Uh, and the limit uh, here we found was uh, that if we have a, a maximum of 250 ppm of water uh, and 70 ppm of nitrogen dioxide, you are on the safe side. Do you exceed that limit? Corrosion starts happening. And also we did other experiment with uh, sulfur dioxide where we saw that we could go up to a quite a high level of, uh, of water uh, when both oxygen and sulfur dioxide was present. So, so in that case, we started building up uh, sort of a, a, a specification of its own. Um, and uh, of course, there were a lot of uh, specification uh, on the market, the typical uh specification was made by what i would call a specification grinder it's literature uh, review you you have some uh, numbers and uh, you look to the literature and then you got the new specification out and that is what uh, we had in the beginning we didn't have much uh, experimental data so there were other uh, considerations to be made like uh, health safety and environmental aspect it was not uh, meant to to sort of uh, save the integrity of the pipeline. It was uh, meant to save people around it. So what we did, uh, the first one I always uh, show you, the, the spec number one, that was the popular one uh, in, in uh, like 10 years ago, most uh, referred to uh, recommendation. We saw it fail miserably. We, we had a lot of acid and, and sulfur. So we Okay, let's tighten the specification a little bit. Uh, go down to maybe one third of it or so, and see uh, could that uh, be an, uh, a choice for the carbon steel uh, pipeline? So we designed a test where we uh, we have uh, three different material here. We have uh, carbon steel, we have uh, stainless duplex, and we have nickel alloy on the sides, and. Uh, in the beginning, we are just stabilizing the impurity. You can see it, uh, let's see, see it uh, here, yeah? Stabilizing, and then we start the nitrogen dioxide. And immediately after the nitrogen dioxide starts, we can um, see that uh, acid is forming. We stop the nitrogen dioxide, see, can we get back to a normal system? Uh, to some extent we could, but it's not very good. And then we start nitrogen dioxide again, and we see the carbon steel coupon in the middle started to be uh, be corroded, and uh, and this is an uh, unacceptable, still an unacceptable uh, uh, specification for for pipeline uh, CO two transport. Uh, then the, we have like two. We tested two specification, and both failed miserably, and uh, we. To how should we proceed now? Well, we have to understand the reaction. That's the thing. We uh, we needed to understand what is going on there. So so we looked. We run the test, which could uh, give us the reaction. And uh, here you could clearly see that the nitrogen monoxide, uh, the blue line, purple line, uh, is in a counter uh, fluctuation with nitrogen dioxide. So they are sort of a linked together with uh, with the reaction with uh, oxygen so that means that if you have a little bit of uh, nitrogen dioxide in your system and a lot of oxygen you will actually uh, never get rid of the nitrogen di dioxide unless it drops out as a uh, nitric acid and uh, other we already seen this uh, nice uh, experiment here where uh, hydrogen sulfide and uh, nitrogen dioxide reacts those uh, we call this an harmful reaction as long as you don't exceed any limits for water which can precipitate and, and become an aqueous phase of its own but normally this is uh, a good reaction and also a confirmation of the, the nitrogen monoxide plus oxygen reaction and then we come to the a little bit more tricky part where uh, uh, where we have to explain the acids 
And, and the typical sign for acid, you could see in the diagram, you can see that water is going up, sulfur dioxide is going up, up to a, a, a peak here, and then it starts decreasing. And it's even more clear on this diagram, sulfur dioxide up, water up, and then it decreases. When the decrease start in your system, then you are producing the acid. And that is verified by observation. So it's a very nice uh, tool to have. So in this case, we are producing uh, the sulfuric acid. Uh, for nitric acid, it's a bit uh, more uncertain. We believe that you might actually have to have an aqueous phase to, to get to nitric acid uh, in your pool. And then you also have some other reaction which might be uh, like the sulfur uh, reaction, which might be a catalyst dependent uh, reaction. So, so to, when you do understand the reaction, you can implement them in a model. And uh, unfortunately, I am an experimental guy, but unfortunately I do realize that we need a model for this because it's too many scenarios to just test uh, ourselves through. So, uh, but we are, uh, the, the results we have, we are delivering to a thermodynamic model and uh, it has improved that one uh, very, very uh, much and they could do some of the simulation. The, thing, uh, the other thing with the thermodynamic model is that they are quite, uh, um, they go to equilibrium often. They don't uh, take the kinetic into account and then you might, during your four day of transport, you might not actually come to equilibrium. And uh, in that case, verification through the experiment work on, in our lab might be quite good. I haven't talked much about the temperature effect, but it's definitely there. We have certain, in this window, we have a lot of things that might happen and might create a, a separate phase in your system. So, um, so it's uh, important to say that if you have a specification, which temperature is that made for? Because if you have a 25 degrees Celsius uh, specification, 100 bar, I don't feel that the pressure is so important, but the temperature is, you can't use the same spe specification at four degrees Celsius. So if you have a CO2 transport system, you have to make sure that the, at the lowest temperature is uh, what the impurity and uh, corrosion is actually uh, given. The pressure effect is uh, is there, but uh, if you look at the typical, uh, the, the, the density of CO2, you see that if you are first at liquid state, it's quite uh, the same density with higher and higher pressure. And also same with water, uh, this is a water uh, solubility limits. And if you get to a liquid state, they are quite stable. So we feel that the pressure is not, uh, it's important, but it's not so important as temperature uh, to, to, to uh, yeah. I will wrap up here, do the summary. Uh, well, carbon steel, can be used and uh, it has to be used, unfortunately. Uh, not unfortunately, but it has to be used, but you have to make sure that aqueous phase is not uh, formed and uh, the surface uh, oxidation species are kept low. So then you are up to a strict uh, specification. Uh, the specification could be relaxed if you, for instance, know what kind of impurity you have. If you don't have any nitrogen dioxide, you could go a little bit higher on the other impurity and so on. So, uh, but still uh, good uh, corrosion data is, uh, is missing. You, we, we, don't, we are not uh, fully in, uh, in a position to understand the whole process design uh, challenges yet, where do the corrosive phases uh, occur and so on. Okay, with that, I want to thank you for uh, the attention and acknowledge the Keller Dance Phase uh, CO2 project where uh, most of the data was uh, made. Okay, so thank you, Bjorn, for uh, your presentation, which was very relevant and interesting. Uh, I'm sure that there will be uh, questions. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, question will be asked uh, later. Now let's move to the second presenter, who is uh, Dr. Ansaloni, and is going to present uh, the compatibility of CO2 and non-metallic materials in the CO2 transport chain.
So, Luca, the floor is yours. Yes. Good. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Chairman. Uh, yes, so today I'm going to talk about compatibility of CO2 and non-metallic materials in the CO2 transport chain. Uh, to get started, just a quick description. Bjorn uh, went already through it, but uh, as you know, we, you can basically divide CCS in three steps, the capture, the transport, and the uh, storage uh, of CO2. And when you specifically look at the CO2 transport side, typically, you, as Bjorn said also, we have two types of uh, transport mode. One is uh, through CO2 pipelines, and the other one is through CO2 ships. And even though you, in these two uh, modes, you get through different unit operation, what is important for us to understand here is that the CO2 is going through um, several stages in which, let's say, the properties of the CO2 can uh, change uh, significantly. And this is an important information when it comes to compatibility with uh, polymers. And uh, related to this uh, two type of uh, transport mode, uh, it, has, it is possible to identify mainly uh, three uh, phase en envelopes at which the uh, CO2 uh, will be transported. When you look at the let me just, sorry. Uh, yes. When you look at the sh uh, ship transport uh, scenario, you basically are uh, talking about uh, cryocompressed CO2 shipping, where you have uh, uh, pressure up to the vapor liquid equilibrium and temperature between minus 30 and minus 50 degrees C. Whereas when you look at the CO2 pipeline transport, you can have two different scenarios. Uh, the first one is the more typical one, where you have dense phase uh, CO2, so supercritical CO2 transported in the pipeline. Typically, this is for like long range uh, distances and uh, where you have pressure up to uh, 200 bar today, but uh, there are, uh, for example, the Northern Light project is aiming to go even higher than this limit. Uh, and the temperature, let's say, between the typical room temperature you can find around the world. And for, uh, let's say, shorter distance and more complex uh, network system, you, it is possible also to uh, transport CO2 through gas phase. In this case, you talk about the same range of uh, temperature, but you are uh, limited in pressure to the, to the gas uh, uh, condition for the CO2. And uh, when it comes to CO2 and non-metallic materials, there is a very important uh, notion that uh, should be understood, which is the fact that CO2 is, a highly soluble, is highly soluble in polymeric materials and has the potential to alter the properties of the polymer components, possibly compromising their uh, functionality. And uh, a very, as Bjorn said, one of the main drivers of CCS is to try to limit the cost. And trying to limit the cost means, for example, try to reduce the existing oil and gas infrastructure uh, to transport CO2 and avoid, let's say, to have to establish new infrastructure. But to do this, you have to look, for example, at what, is, what type of non-metallic materi non -metallic materials are present in your, uh, CO2 trans in, in your existing infrastructure to decide if they are compatible. What we did at Sintef was that we tried to uh, look at different uh, uh, type of polymers that can be present today in the oil and gas infrastructure. We divided in two main families. The first one was engineering thermoplastics. Uh, typically, they are polyethylene, PTFE, PVDF, and, and PEAK. And these are typically used uh, as tubes, pipes, tanks, or a vessel. And then you have a second family of material uh, that is called elastomers that are typically used as sealant and gasket and comprise a wide range of uh, material that are all listed here. A very important property of especially the elastomers is their TG. TG defines the so-called gas transition temperature, uh, basically defining when your uh, polymer behaves as rubber or as, as a glass. And in order to have a proper uh, seal, then you need uh, the polymer to be in a rubber state. So you let's say that for elastomers, the gas transition temperature typically defines the, the minimum sorry, operating temperature for the polymer. An important aspect to understand, however, is that when you look at Hans and solubility parameters that are, uh, let's say, a simple way of defining how two, uh, co two um, components can interact uh, together, you see that the CO2 can overlap with quite many, for example, of the elastomers and is also close to many of the thermoplastic materials, meaning that 
CO2 will easily uh, solubilize, as, a, as a, it was mentioned in the beginning of this slide, into the polymeric materials, and then this can lead to uh, several uh, different effects. And here I will try to sort of give you a hint of uh, what type of effect you can expect when you put CO2 in contact with polymers. So to understand the transport mechanism of CO2 into polymeric phases, uh, you can basically rely on what is called solution diffusion mechanism, where the permeability uh, of gas is basically defined as the uh, product of its diffusivity and its solubility inside the polymeric matrix. And when you look, for example, at the uh, temperature, um, you basically see that typically diffusivity is a thermally activated process, meaning that your diffus diffusion coefficient will increase with temperature, while solubility is a, a temperature deactivated process. So the CO2 will tend to solubilize at larger extent when the temperature is lower. And for example, if you think about a condition like cryocompressed CO2 shipping, uh, then you will find yourself in a situation where you will have probably high solubility of CO2 in your polymeric matrix while the diffusion will be hindered by the uh, temperature. And this can create issue uh, when it comes to uh, rapid gas decompression events. Why? Well, because you then find yourself in a situation where you have dissolved a lot of gas into your polymeric materials, and then in case of a rapid gas decompression events happen, then the gas will try to escape very quickly out of the material, creating possible stresses due to the fact that you have a, a diffusion limited uh, process, so that internally in the polymeric matrix, uh, you, can, you can create mechanical stresses. And what is happening in case of, for example, rapid gas decompression damages? Well, as you can see here, this is a, a pristine elastomer that was tested in our laboratory. You can see that uh, after uh, rapid gas decompression events that happen at moderately pressure, uh, moderate pressure of CO2 uh, and even uh, close to uh, room temperature, you can see that, for example, blistering phenomena like formation of bubbles, as you can see here, can happen, basically changing the uh, properties, especially of the surface of the material in this case. Uh, an interesting inf uh, information will be then to understand if this type of event or this type of blistering effect then has a significant effect on the barrier properties of the material, uh, because this is, let's say, the main function of the elastomers in your system. A second effect can be then related to the fact to the, to the aspect that, as I said, CO2 is a soluble gas in polymers, and by absorbing more and more CO2, what you will observe is that you will have an expansion in volume, because you are dissolving uh, CO2 molecules inside your polymetric ma polymeric matrix, while your stiffness the, or the stiffness of the polymer material will then decrease at higher CO2 concentration. And why? This is because uh, the CO2 will act as a plasticizer uh, for the CO2 polymer system, changing the mechanical properties itself. And these are two aspects that are very important because they can lead to what is called, to, to an effect that is related to the removal of additives. Even though you talk about non-metallic materials and typically these are defined as polymers, in reality these are complex systems where uh, poly, the polymeric part is only uh, a, a certain percentage, but you also have inside other molecules like, like uh, stabilizers, for example, antioxidants uh, to prevent oxidant degradation and also plasticizer or so-called softener in order to give the mechanical uh, properties that you need. And once these are removed because of, for example, as I said, CO2 dissolution into the polymer, then the, the, the function of the material can be compromised. And one last thing to consider that was actually covered very, very well by Bjorn in his previous presentation is that uh, you don't actually deal just with the CO2, but you actually deal with a complex uh, CO2 uh, gaseous stream that involves a lot of impurities. And when and these impurities level are also dependent, for example, from the capture site. Here is just a list uh, that we made then where we look at different type of capture technology and what type of impurities can be uh, found. And as Bjorn also highlighted, it's not just a single impurity itself, but you can also have reaction inside. The simplest way that one can have to understand about compatibility uh, of polymer with these type of impurities would be to look at compatibility table that you can find uh, from several suppliers. Uh, what we did here is just we gather uh, a lot of these compatibility table and we put it in a simple, uh, in a simple one. Uh, but this is related to highly concentrated uh, substances, meaning that is like uh, highly concentrated SO2 or SO3 or NO2. 
uh, meaning that when you go to the impurity level, then the effect can be rather uncertain. For example, here you see that many of the polymer material uh, struggles when they are in contact with, uh, with sulfur-based uh, uh, components. Um, but this means also that uh, this doesn't mean that they can they struggle the moment that this is present only in PPM level, and this is something that has to be further uh, investigated. But then uh, a question arises, uh, for example, for engineers that have to design a CO2 transport uh, system, and it is how to correctly select uh, polymer material for this application. Well, what you would typically do is that you would look at uh, international standard, like the one published by ISO that is very active uh, when it comes to CCS. And there is there are also a lot of recommended practice or guideline out there. Uh, in this case, for example, DNB is very active. But unfortunately, when it comes to non-metallic materials, also in these type of documents, you will, you will find very little information. And especially you will find no means of uh, validating and qualifying uh, your uh, your choice of material choice against the uh, CO2 transport uh, application of interest. And therefore, what we did uh, in Sintef is that we have uh, established a project that is called CO2 Epoch, uh, which is led by Sintef, uh, and where we look at characterization and prediction of the CO2 effect on polymeric materials within the CO2 uh, transport chain. Together with Sintef, we have, we have other two um, research partners that are the University of Oslo and also the uh, University uh, of Bologna in Italy. And we have uh, five uh, industrial partners that are uh, contributing financially to the project, which are uh, Equinur, Gasco, Saipem, Shell and Total Energies. And the project is mainly financed by the Climate Pro Program of the Research Council of Norway. If you're interested to know more about our project, uh, we also have a website and you can find here the link, uh, or if you simply Google CO2 Epoch, you will probably be directed to, to our page. And I, I invite you to, to visit it if you are uh, interested. What we did in the project actually is that in order to answer to some of the question that I, I, I raised uh, before, we have established infrastructure. For example, we have established a CO2 permeation unit that are able to work with the a liquid CO2 or supercritical CO2 in order to determine the barrier properties of polymeric materials under these conditions. We have also modified an existing uh, CO2 sorption unit uh, that allow us to better understand kinetics and thermodynamics of CO2 sorption in uh, polymeric uh, materials. That is actually very useful also to develop models that uh, especially University of Bologna is working uh, a lot with and it will allow us to uh, as you will see later predict also some of the some of these properties in uh, in a polymeric system in addition we have also established autoclaves that are allowing us to for example look into what is happening to non-metallic materials in the ship based scenario so with liquid uh, co2 and also autoclave for the pipeline scenario where we can work with the supercritical co2 and uh, for the sake of time today, I'm going to show you some uh, of the results that we have achieved in the project uh, related to the to the elastomer. And this is what I call here the elastomer case. Um, for this uh, um, uh, summary, I have chosen to, to show you the results we obtained for two different materials. One is FKM. This is a fluoropolymer uh, largely used in the, in the oil and gas industry because of very good compatibility with hydrocarbons. And the second one is EPDM, uh, which is uh, not used at all in the oil and gas infrastructure. And this is due to poor uh, compatibility with, uh, with hydrocarbons. I want to stress here also that, as I said in the beginning, even though I call these polymers, in reality, they are systems as, uh, for example, they have a certain amount of uh, carbon black that is indicated here by, by uh, CB. And uh, that is quite consistent because you will see it goes up to almost 40%. And what we did is that we uh, established a set of tests. Uh, we did some uh, sorption tests to understand, as I said, kinetics and uh, thermodynamics of CO2 sorption in a wide range of temperature. Uh, and then we did autoclave exposure tests, uh, especially looking at the uh, liquid uh, uh, CO2 scenario because um, we knew, or cryocompressed CO2 scenario because no data were reported about this in uh, literature. And in subsequently, we did also DSC analysis to understand the uh, effect on TG, that as I said in the beginning, it's a very important parameter for the elastomers. And we did also rapid gas decompression uh, events to see what type of exp 
uh, effect we were getting. And this is just a picture of the autoclave that uh, was used. So coming to the uh, sorption test, uh, this is uh, this plot shows you here the uptake of CO2 uh, as a function of uh, pressure. Uh, this is for the FKM uh, material containing 37.5% uh, carbon black. Um, there is something very peculiar to understand here that, as you can see, there is an exponential trend uh, when it comes to increase of CO2 concentration in the polymeric phase but increasing pressure. This determines the fact that when we reach the um, uh, vapor-liquid equilibrium, you can basically see that at lower temperature, you will basically be defined uh, by a higher uh, CO2 solubility. And the lines here are not just for, to guide the, the, your eyes, but uh, in reality, these are models that have been developed uh, by the University of Bologna that are able to basically predict the CO2 uptake and the CO2 solubility in polymeric materials in uh, a wide range of uh, uh, conditions. A very different scenario is obtained in case of the EPDM instead. As you can see, we have chosen a EPDM with a very similar uh, carbon black content, and this is because we know that the carbon black content uh, can have a significant effect, uh, let's say, on the CO2 sorption as well. Um, but in this case, you can see that the increase in trend is uh, simply linear uh, with the pressure, and uh, not exponential as in the case of the FKM. And this leads also to an uh, opposite effect when it comes to when you reach, uh, say, the vapor liquid equilibrium. Uh, because you are basically having a lower CO2 uptake at lower temperature. And this is, again, limited, defined, let's say, by the, by the uh, trend that you have in case of uh, CO2 sorption. And this is an important piece of information uh, because, as you can see, a polymer that is now not used at all in the oil and gas infrastructure becomes suddenly very interesting for CO2 transport because it has uh, lower uh, CO2 absorption. We did also test on uh, CO2 diffusivity that are presented here. Um, it is very interesting to understand for FKM that uh, CO2 diffusivity is, uh, is very much impacted by the uh, CO2 content in your polymeric matrix. As you can see, when you typically what you would expect, and you can see this in the EPDM case, is that at lower temperature, your diffusion coefficient is dropping significantly. Uh, and EPDM in this sense is behaving quite uh, ideally. But in case of FKM, because of the very high solubility that I showed you before, swelling phenomena under, uh, are undergoing to a significant extent, and these are impacting the way that CO2 diffuses out of it, basically also increasing significantly the CO2 diffusion coefficient, and you reach diffusion coefficient higher at lower temperature, which is quite peculiar. What we did then is that we took uh, the FKM material that was the one that was uh, affected mostly by the CO2 and uh, uh, we put it in uh, in the autoclave uh, that I showed with you in the beginning. We kept it exposed for quite a long time under condition of around minus 30 degrees C and pressure above the CO2 vapor pressure that is shown here and then we did one single rapid gas decompression event with a rapid gas decompression rate of 4.5 bar uh, per minute Due to the Joule Thompson effect, we saw also quite significant uh, drop in temperature in our autoclave down to minus, degrees C, uh, minus 70 degrees C that then was recovered over quite uh, some time. And the first very interesting uh, effect that we observe is that upon exposure of CO2, then the TG, so the glass transition temperature of the materials was significantly impacted. And the way the, and the, the extent of the impact was higher at higher CO2 uh, content in the polymeric matrix. If you see, for example, the FKM case containing the carbon black, this, uh, you have an unexposed material TG of around minus 15 degrees C, which basically would limit your application of FKM at minus 15 degrees C. But after leaving, let's say, the sample inside the autoclaying long enough to equilibrate the FKM to the uh, um, CO2 condition on the, on the, on the outer phase, you can see that there is a significant drop of about 25 degrees C in terms of TG. And this brings, let's say, your TG of the polymer close to minus 40 degrees C, making it, for example, attractive for a CO2 transport application where the temperature is kept around uh, minus 30 degrees C. In case of the EPDM, we observe something similar. So also in this case, you have an impact on the TG. It's much more limited, only to 8 degrees C but it is actually extending the range of applicability of EPDM to values that are below the triple point of CO2, meaning that 
you can basically use EPDM almost in the entire cryo compressed range for CO2 uh, transport. But then the question is, okay, this is actually a benefit when it comes to uh, extending the operability range uh, for, the, for the material, but what is happening in case of rapid gas decompression event? So what we did, as I said, we did one event, and this is the results, for example, that we got for FKM uh, that is not containing any uh, carbon black inside. You probably, uh, I hope that you see, but basically what you get is basically a popping uh, elastomer. So this behaves almost like a popcorn, and the CO2 is creating a significant uh, blistering phenomena that is, um, let's say, damaging uh, your material. And what we observe is that, this is a second video that I have, is that this is also impacted by how much carbon black you have dissolved inside, you have present inside the uh, polymeric phase. Meaning that at no carbon black, then the blistering phenomena is huge. While increasing the carbon black content, then you are conferring a better mechanical properties of the material but still you see that the material, the, 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 the dog bones that are reported here are quite uh, much stressed uh, and uh, um, they are still anyway uh, showing blistering phenomena. This is simply to show you that uh, there are some, uh, some uh, effects related also to volume swelling. We measure, for example, a linear volume swelling on both cases of around 30 to 35%, which correspond to a more than 100% swelling on the volumetric uh, phase. And uh, one very last thing that I wanted to say is that it seems that this blistering phenomena after that the CO2 uh, is removed is reversible, meaning that if you leave the polymer there for quite some time, then you will see that, uh, that these bubbles will, uh, will disappear. Problem is that your RGD damage is, is permanent. So this polymer will not uh, behave as good as barrier uh, in, in, in terms of barrier properties as it was designed uh, for. And this brings me to actually the conclusion of my uh, presentation. Uh, so just to say that uh, CO2 transport uh, creates some challenging uh, condition for polymeric material, especially, and this is because the CO2 can induce significant changes on uh, in the properties of non-metallic uh, material, potentially leading to accident accidental uh, CO2 leakage towards the atmosphere, vanishing, let's say, all the efforts that you make in, in, uh, in the capture step. And uh, an important also piece of information that I want to deliver is that polymers that today are not uh, perfect or were not used in the oil and gas uh, infrastructure can actually perform uh, very good uh, for CO2, like in the case of EPDM. And in terms of outlook, uh, for sure what we uh, uh, know is that there are there is a need of gathering more data uh, when it comes to uh, all type of polymers, elastomer, thermoplastic, but also composites. Uh, that were not uh, included uh, in our uh, project and uh, also that we want to study the effect under uh, more realistic cases. For example, all the results that I've shown you have been obtained for non-constrained configuration, but what is happening, for example, once that your polymer is constrained in a orange seal, uh, uh, and how does that behave? And finally, as I said, we are uh, developing models and we are continuously uh, trying to improve these models, uh, aiming uh, to predict absorption and diffusion of CO2 in polymer, but also understanding RGD damaging uh, as well as removal uh, of uh, additives and uh, plasticizers. And this was uh, the end. Thank you very much. So thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Luca, for your insightful and interesting presentation. So now we open the uh, question and the answer uh, session. Uh, so uh, I um, would uh, uh, first uh, invite uh, the uh, attendees to write question in the chat. We'll dedicate around 10 minutes to it. Um, so I would start with the, the uh, well, the first question was, uh, on the presentation. So there will not be presentation made available, but please notice that uh, there is the uh, YouTube channel of uh, Excel where uh, the, uh, this uh, webinar that has been registered will be broadcasted. So you will find uh, uh, that online. Then a question for uh, um, uh, Luca. Uh, do you also test uh, the same polymer with different uh, hardness 
and uh, then will the hardness properties contribute to the glass transition temperature change? Yes, uh, that's a good question. No, now we are focused more in understanding also because there is some questions that we had to answer first related to the experimental procedure we were using. Uh, so we have now uh, finalized and we are sure that the TG drop uh, that we have observed for, for example, FKM and EPDM is, is real. And we were more focusing right now in understanding what type of extent is uh, valid also for other polymers, but for sure investigating also hardness effect is, is definitely something we should consider. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I have a question for uh, uh, Bjorn. Uh, so you have shown, uh, um, I mean, the impact of the different uh, um, impurities during tests, but uh, one uh, I think is very relevant for, uh, uh, I mean, the manufacturer of pipelines because they told me that uh, even changing a bit the level of uh, presence of some impurities like NO2 uh, will impact a lot the cost of the of the material selected. So the question is, by reducing uh, uh, the water levels, because in uh, the most recent CO2 specification uh, that uh, I saw for uh, the most advanced project, there are limits on uh, water and oxygen that are down to 10 ppm. Do you think that with uh, this kind of uh, specification uh, can be safely used the carbon steel? So with 10 ppm of water, and uh, oxygen uh, can deal with uh, limit of uh, NO2, SO2 of the order of uh, 50, 100 ppm as you were showing, or do you think that uh, more uh, room is available for optimization of the CO2 specification? Because what we see is that now the operator are going to be very strict and maybe there is limit to relax the specification. So what are your um, ideas and uh, your contribution on this? You, we cannot hear you. Now, let's try. Yeah, now, now, you, now you can hear me. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, I think yeah, that is a question a lot of people, I, I got that question a lot. And uh, uh, by only uh, reducing water, you're not necessarily in a safe state because uh, as uh, the equation to create acid, you only need uh, more or less hydrogen sulfide and nitrogen dioxide. So if you have enough of them, they will create the water and they will create the acid needed to corrode it. But what we have seen that uh, we are getting down to 10 ppm on, uh, on many of the impurities. And that is, uh, for me, it's a very strict uh, specification. But it's it's the knowledge, based on the knowledge we have now, that uh, we can't allow any separate phase falling out in the pipeline or the ship. So uh, we have to be on the safe side there. But if you could, for instance, remove nitrogen dioxide completely from the system, it's possible to go up to 100, maybe 150 with oxygen uh, uh, and so on. And we also see that, uh, that uh, the hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide is also very uh, reactive to towards the, the nitrogen dioxide. So, so again, if you if you can remove one of the joker or uh, one of the the, the key uh, element, which are by far the most oxidation agent you have in the system, then you can relax uh, the system. And I know that a lot of capturing techniques they don't actually have uh, that much uh, nitrogen dioxide. Uh, in the system, but it will be a problem if you have a hub system where you have five different capturing source giving uh, to one hub and uh, the main pipeline is going up. But yes, there are room for real relaxation, but you have to keep keep really track on what, what which species you have uh, have in there. Thank you. So uh, one takeaway is reduce as much as possible NO2 and then maybe you can relax a bit uh, water and oxygen but pay attention to all the co2 sources uh, then for you another yeah, question right. Bjorn. Um, what are the next steps in the sense that you can have uh, multiple impurity impurities are you focusing on some let me say secondary impurities like uh, uh, amines uh, um, maybe glycol uh, uh, i don't know some uh, um, other species uh, 
or uh, uh, hydrate formation? Is there any room for research for that? Yeah, it's a good question. We have uh, launched a KDC phase four now, and that, there we will look more into other impurities and also the hydrate. The hydrate falls underneath the temperature uh, effect. You have a, a good uh, good temperature effect, and and we will probably uh, attack at least hydrate in a, a engineer state where if you can't see it, it's not a problem, <laughs> not a not an academic state where you could actually have hydrate there, even though we, then we can't see it and it's no problem. But yeah, also including other uh, impurities like uh, maybe tag for the for the uh, dry up uh, conditions or dry up stage or amines, of course. Uh, yeah, a lot of people are asking for that, and uh, we will by far, as far as we can, try to to introduce that. But it's a bit more difficult to introduce it in the system because it's. It's normally liquids. You have done it with water, but uh, we could probably build up same uh, system with uh, with the other liquids as well. But it's easier with the gases. <laughs> we do stay away from uh, like nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, which uh, Luca probably is uh, more interesting in. But uh, we, we find that more like uh, my inert gas from a corrosion perspective. So so we don't. Uh, we don't like to introduce them, but we, we do accept that they will be there. So, yeah. Okay, very, very interesting. Thank you. Then I have a question for um, Luca. Uh, you have shown clearly that uh, the uh, EPDM material um, is, uh, I mean, much better than the uh, FKM. So first question is, uh, do you think that it will be a reference material adopted for gasket ceilings? And then I have a curiosity, the, co the order of magnitude of the cost uh, is much higher than the one for the, I mean, reference material used in oil and gas? No, as a, so I answered the last question first. Um, no, because this is anyway a commercial, widely deployed material that, as I said, it was not used in the oil and gas just because of incompatibility with hydrocarbons. And that's why you don't find it there today. I think that it has a very good potential. Uh, we did all, this study also to let people understand that uh, maybe you, you get a better chance to, to have more compatibility if you replace when you can, uh, also in existing infrastructure, uh, like polymers, like all fluorinated polymers, we believe are going to behave very similarly to, to the one that I showed here. Maybe some will swell more, some will swell less, but there is a quite high uh, interaction between CO2 and fluoro atoms, um, which is instead fluoro atoms were used in the oil and gas because it was giving good compatibility with many other uh, molecules. <clears throat> uh, in general, um, yeah. uh, we believe that EPDM has a good chance uh, to become maybe more performing uh, as an elastomer uh, compared to many others that are used today in the oil and gas infrastructure, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, let me check uh, if there are other questions. Uh, there. Uh, there is a question, yes, to Mr. Morland. Have you tested or will test the corrosion rate for liquid phase CO2? Yeah, that is uh, the next step. Uh, we have we have done this now for over 10 years. And uh, the idea when we started was that we will have the corrosion rate ready the first year. But uh, we met so many challenges and uh, we had so little knowledge of what's actually going on there. So we have spent the, uh, the, la the last 10 years just uh, learning how to, how, what will happen. But now we are in a state where we do understand much more and uh, we can produce more corrosion rates and correctly corrosion rate because we didn't want to start with the corrosion rate in the beginning when we knew that the corrosion rate was actually will actually be wrong so so but now we are in a state where uh, where we could uh, produce corrosion rate we could be do worst case we could do a conservative uh, method and and i guess for us then we give it to the operator and they will decide where where will the the actual corrosion rate in the transport system be and uh, in some cases worst case maybe for a couple of days and then the rest of the, the, the years, it's nothing. But yes, we will do that. Okay, thank you.
So I see no other question in the chat. So uh, I uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Morland and Dr. Ansaloni for uh, uh, their very interesting speeches. And uh, uh, I thank the, the organizer, uh, um, Excel, especially in this case, OGS. And uh, I invite you all to uh, check the website of Excel, www.excel.org, for uh, the video of this webinar and of the, the previous one. So thank you all the uh, attendees for your participation, and uh, uh, I wish you a good afternoon. Bye-bye.